watercolour brushes for beginners. Today we're going to go through every single type of watercolour brush. I'm going to show you how to use them too. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel we do all things watercolour as well as watercolour pencils, drawing, mixed media, even a little bit of business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you'll get notified every time I have a video for you and I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So it's a bold claim, isn't it, that we're going to have every single type of watercolour paintbrush in this video. And I'm fully aware that somewhere in a workshop someone is designing a new shape as we speak. There are so many different types on the market. Some of them are quite gimmicky. Somewhere somebody is designing a new shape today and they'll tell you that it's for painting eyelashes on hedgehogs and you absolutely must have it. It's vital that you buy it and it's only $25. So hopefully today we can sort through all of that marketing and look at the different brush shapes and what you actually need. Now this video is not sponsored and I'll just be using you know random old brushes that I have lying around in my studio but you should also be aware that I do have an arrangement with a UK manufacturer and I do have brushes in my own name as well and I'll tell you about those but we're not particularly looking at brands today we're just looking at shapes and uses of brushes. There are also one or two brushes in this video that I'll tell you about that I don't own myself. There are many reasons for that. One of the main reasons is that some very traditional types of watercolour paint brushes are only made with animal hair which I personally don't buy but don't worry I'm going to put pictures of those up on the screen as well so that you get a full idea of all of the paint brushes that is possible for you to use. I have divided the paint brushes into three main categories so although you get all different kinds of shapes and sizes we'll be looking at three main types of brush. So the first main type would be a round brush, the second would be a flat brush and the third would be a texture brush and those can be round or flat. If you don't know what I mean by round and flat don't worry I'm just about to explain it all to you and keep watching until the end of the video because I'm going to tell you what I would choose if I could only if I was on a desert island I could only choose one paintbrush what would be the most useful watercolour paintbrush to choose after that I'm going to tell you what would be the three main paintbrushes that I would choose if I had only a choice of three for the rest of my life perhaps and then after that we're going to add two more so we've got five brushes I'm going to show you those five brushes those are the five brushes that I do 99.99999% of my work with so let's get started I'm going to point the camera downwards and let's look first of all at what a watercolor paintbrush actually is so let's look at some paintbrushes now one of these is much longer than the others and the bristles are much coarser and much lighter in color that's because this is an acrylic painting brush. Now acrylic brushes and oil brushes tend to actually be even longer than this. Acrylic and oil painting brushes tend to be longer because people tend to paint standing up at a canvas. Sometimes the canvas stays wet for a long time in the case of oil paints and the artist needs to be at a little bit of a distance from all of that wet paint. You also need a coarser bristle for acrylic painting because the paint is thicker and you need to be able to manipulate it and push it around a little bit. So let's put that one aside for now and let's look at a couple of watercolour paint brushes. So they nearly always have a wooden handle unless they are incredibly cheap and then they might be plastic. The metal part here is called the ferrule and then you have the bristles. Now there are two main shapes for the ferrules. We have this one here which is like a tube, it's circular, you can see that. And then we have this one here, which has actually been flattened at the end. So this would be a flat brush, a type of flat brush anyway, and this would be a round brush. So it's got a point on, but it's called a round brush. The end of this one is curved and rounded, but it's called a flat brush. Don't shoot the messenger. I don't make the rules. The next thing to consider is the bristles themselves. They can be animal hair or they can be synthetic. So these ones are synthetic. Synthetic tends to have a little bit more spring. It can be a little bit less hard wearing, but much, much cheaper. Then you get animal hair brushes. Animal hair brushes tend to be a lot fluffier and a lot more floppy. They don't have as much spring. Typical animal hair components would be squirrel or at the expensive end of the range, the most expensive type of watercolour brush you can get is a Kalinsky sable, which is made of hair from the towel of the Russian mink. Now, although I may have some old animal hair brushes in my collection because, you know, they were gifted to me years ago, I bought them before I even considered what they were made of. I no longer buy any kind of animal hair brushes for ethical reasons. People will tell you that Kalinsky sable, that the towel fur 
is just a byproduct of the rest of the animal. That's really a little bit disingenuous. And if you buy Kalinsky Sable, you are supporting the fur trade. It's not even a meat product. I'm not going to tell you what to buy, but it's just something to be aware of. Now, you should never throw a brush away. If you have any animal hair brushes, but you no longer, like me, you no longer want to buy animal hair brushes, don't be throwing them in the bin. It does no use whatsoever. Spoiler alert, the animal's already dead. You're not gonna bring it back to life by chucking the brush in the bin. And also, there's a definite problem in society with waste and with too many products being wasted. So you should never just throw a brush away. The best brush for animals and for the environment is the one that you already own. So now you understand what we're dealing with, let's have a look at all the different shapes of round brush. I'm gonna show you how to use them too. So let's have a look at some round brushes. Now, the first thing you'll notice, and this is the same with flat brushes, is that they have little numbers on, they have sizes on. Now, wouldn't it be lovely if every manufacturer used the same size range? Unfortunately, they don't. They vary between brands, which is super helpful, isn't it? They do tend to start at a zero or a double zero. That would be the tiny, tiny, tiniest ones. And then they go up to tens and twelves, even sometimes up to twenties and thirties. So this one here is a size 20, but be aware that if you bought a size 20 in a different brand, it might be a slightly different size. This one I would use when painting very large areas. I really only use it for when I'm painting very big skies because it holds an awful lot of paint. And these big brushes, these round brushes, generally they hold a lot of paint in this part here and then they have a pointed end. So they really are the most versatile type of paint brushes. So let's have a look at what the round brush does. So I've got a large one here. I think this would be, I haven't looked at it, is it a 10 or a 12? Yes, I think it's a 10. So what you do with a large brush like this is we can mix up some paint. And as I said, it's got a nice deep body to it and it will hold a lot of paint. So you can use it to paint a very large area with. And can you see I'm getting a lovely flat wash there. But I can also, and bearing in mind this is a fairly old brush, I can also get the most delicate fine lines with it. So this would be your all round watercolor brush. You can make all sorts of marks with it. Now from there we have more of what would be called a detailer brush. So this is exactly the same brush, but it's just a little bit smaller. And again, it's still going to hold quite a lot of paint. So how do you know whether to use a large brush or a slightly smaller brush like this? You should use the largest brush that you can possibly use to manipulate the paint in the area and in the way that you need to manipulate it. So in other words, the bigger the brush, the more paint it holds and the more easily it will flow and the nicer the paint will look on the paper. But there may come a stage where your brush is too big and you think, I need to paint in this small area, I need to do a bit more detail, and that's the point where you move down to a smaller brush. But only move down the sizes if you have to, because the paint always applies more easily with a large brush. Now these brushes continue to go down in size, so we've got another one here. This one in this brand is a size two. And again, you can put quite a lot of detail on with this, but it's going to run out of paint a little bit quicker. There we are, starting to run out of paint. It's gonna run out of paint quicker than that larger brush, which is why you should always go as big as you can. Now, we also have a very, very fine brush. This would be a size zero or maybe a double zero. Now, you're only going to use a really, really tiny brush like this in very specific situations. I mean, I can count on the fingers of one hand how often in a year I use a paintbrush like this. Some years, never at all. If you've got something like eyelashes to paint, if you're doing something tiny and something botanical, this brush has got rather bent, actually, as it's been shoved in with all my other brushes. But if you want really, really fine detail, particularly doing things like eyes, maybe the center of flowers, you want little tiny dots, little tiny lines, then a little tiny detail brush like this is the one, but it's certainly not essential. You can also make little marks like this with quite a big brush, really, which is why I wouldn't be inclined to go down to that smaller brush unless I felt I absolutely had to. Now, those brushes were all the same. They just varied in size. Here we have a different type of round brush. This is called a rigger. So if you have a look at it, it's got a much longer set of bristles. They're long and thin 
much longer than a standard paintbrush. And this one is specifically for painting long lines. It was invented to paint ships rigging. Nowadays, people would be more likely to use it for painting things like grasses. So here we are, we can paint really nice, fine, long lines with this one. Is it essential? Absolutely not. In fact, I can tell you, although I own one, I don't think I ever, ever use it. It's not to say there's anything wrong with using it. If it suits you and if you like it, you can get some lovely long, thin lines with a rigger. The last type of brush I have here is quite different from the rest. It's called a water brush or a water pen. And it actually has a barrel here and inside you can put water in. So what you do is you get your water and it's squeezy. So we can squeeze in just like a pipette. It's going to pick up the water and then you've got water in your brush ready to go. So you don't have to dip in to a jar of water, although it's always handy to have one on hand and you can paint with this brush. Now these brushes are great. Sometimes you have to squeeze a little bit to get the water moving. They're quite a firm brush. They're definitely synthetic and they're very good for if you're working outside, if you want to do something like watercolor pencils and you really don't want to take a load of water jars out with you, this can be a great brush to use. I actually knew a lady who painted in oils very proficiently and she came to me to learn watercolor and she actually did all of her watercolor painting just with one of these brush pens. She just liked the feel of it. So they really, really are quite a nice brush and quite useful. Like the other types of brush, they're quite versatile. Of course, they won't hold as much as a huge paintbrush, but if you're working on a small area, you're doing something botanical, maybe you're sketching in the garden, or perhaps you've just got some watercolor pencils and you're taking them on a holiday and you don't want to fuss around with a load of water jars, a brush pen is great for you. At this point in the video, as always, can I remind you please to press the like button, the thumbs up. At the time of making this video, I've just gone past 70,000 subscribers. I'm so grateful to all of you for watching this little YouTube channel. And if you can like, share, subscribe, or leave me a nice comment, then you'll help this channel to grow even further and I can teach even more people how to paint and draw. Now, one other type of round brush is a mop brush. These tend to be a traditional type of brushes that are often used in Chinese or Japanese painting. They look quite different to regular paint brushes. They're a very similar shape to a round brush. They tend to have more of a belly, so they're sort of fatter. They still have a point on. They often have plastic and wire wrapped around the wooden handle. You don't take that off, you leave that on. They tend to be animal hair, which is why I don't own one of them. I am putting a picture up for you to look at now. They are a little bit less controllable than a standard round brush but having said that people tend to use them for that Chinese art where you are working very very loosely and making very very specific marks. So they're just a different type of round brush and they are much loved by painters that work in a loose manner or just like to make those very large very simple marks on their paintings. After the round brushes come the flat brushes and these have many many different uses. Let's point the camera downwards and have a look at flat brushes next. So flat brushes also come in all different shapes and sizes. In fact, I think the ends have more variation in shape than the round brushes do. So we're gonna look at these next. So the first type of brush I have for you is just a large brush with a fairly fluffy end. It's not particularly sharply cut at the end. This one I think is probably an old animal hair brush, probably a squirrel hair brush or something like that. And I actually keep this one simply for applying water to my paintings. I find it's really useful to have a paintbrush that you never put in paint. And the reason for that is you've probably been in the situation where you've picked up a paintbrush and you think it's clean and you apply water to your sky area and then a little bit of bright pink or something comes out. Super annoying, isn't it? So I keep a brush like this simply for applying water and I never put paint on it. Now there's another type of brush similar to this. It's a Japanese brush. The actual way of pronouncing it, I'll put a photo up on the screen for you. The actual way of pronouncing it is Hake, I believe. However, I've always called it Hake brush. I used to watch videos by, I think it's Ron Ranson who does lots of painting with this type of brush. And I think he called it a Hake brush as well. What can I say? I'm from London, but I believe the proper pronunciation is Hake. And these brushes are also, they're quite, they tend to be quite cheap and they're great for applying water. So you can use one for the, you know, what I use this brush for. 
but they also can be used for really rough, scruffy landscape painting. They've got quite stiff bristles. They're really quite a fun brush. I don't personally use them myself. Next up, we have various types of flat brush. They're just a little bit more formally cut, a little bit more square cut. These are great for making flat washes. So that's an area where you're applying an area of flat paint. So you can see you can do it with a round brush, but actually it's even easier with a flat brush. So if you had a large sky, for instance, this paint's a bit green, but you'll know what I'm, what I'm talking about. If you had a large sky and you wanted just to take your paintbrush backwards and forwards like this, almost like pasting wallpaper, you can get a fabulous flat wash. It's also very good, a brush like this. I'll get some darker paint. It's also very good if you're trying to go round things like square buildings and things like that, or even to paint square buildings. So you can make these nice square marks with the brush. Another thing you can do, which is a little used technique with watercolors, is you can pick up two different colors. So I can pick up, say, pink on one side of the brush, and then let's get some Payne's Gray on the other side of the brush, and I can paint two colors at once. This is a technique that's more often used actually by people doing craft painting, but nevertheless, it's a fun one to know. Now, flat brushes, just like round brushes, come in a variety of sizes and they go down quite small. Now, once you get to the small square cut flat brushes like this, to me, they have very little application use in watercolor painting. The point of a brush like this is to actually leave small square marks but the problem is, I mean, I'm painting here on dry white paper, but the problem is when you're painting on top of other colors, the watercolor doesn't really leave brush marks like that. You need other ways of getting texture. So those lovely little square marks that you might make in acrylic or oil paint really are lost with a brush like this, and it doesn't hold that much water. So I find the small square brushes to be somewhat less useful for watercolor painting. Next up, we have that square brush I showed you at the beginning with the rounded end. This is called a filbert. Again, to me, this is a brush which is much more suited to oil painting or acrylics. But if you know, if you wanted to get maybe a loose background in and put colors in like this without getting too much detail, and you didn't want those hard sort of square edges that tend to get left when you're using a square edged flat brush, then you could try a filbert brush like this. Again, to me, it's not a brush that's particularly useful for watercolor painting. Next up, we have what they call a cat's tongue. And you can see that it's almost shaped like a, a gothic arch. Now, again, this is a brush that I almost never use for watercolor painting. I understand that flower painters like it, though. If you're into painting those sort of very simple flower pictures, then a brush like this can make an interesting petal shape. From there, we have a whole slew of brushes which have an angled end. So you can get an angled flat brush. So you can get a flat brush like this one that's just been cut across the end at an angle. So it enables you to do more of a tapered effect to your brush strokes. And then you get brushes that have been cut in more of a shape. So it's still an angle, but it's got almost this curve shape. And these are named all sorts of different things. I've heard them called dagger brushes. Sometimes they'll be called angled flats. They'll be called sword liners. And what they enable you to do is to make a mark that's quite wide and then can taper quite distinctly. So you could use them perhaps for getting grasses, something like that, again, for flower painting. They've got that ability to go really narrow and then really wide. You can get almost calligraphy type marks with these brushes. Do I use them? Absolutely never. Now, another type of flat brush is a fan brush. This is actually a makeup brush because although I have some fan brushes, they're not standard sharp edged cut fan brushes like this. A fan brush will make curved circular marks. They can also be used for blending areas in oil painting and acrylics. So they get that kind of feathering going on. Again, it's a shape of brush that to me is almost useless for watercolor painting. Now, the last type of flat brush I have is an acrylic brush. Now, this is the brush that I had at the beginning. This is an acrylic brush, but actually these can be really useful. They've got very firm bristles. So if you've got paints that have dried, like these ones here, or if you're using pan or block paints, what I would do is use these to mix your initial colors up. You don't want to be using these really soft, delicate watercolor brushes and messing up the point on them when you can use a scruffy old cheap acrylic brush to mix your paints beforehand. Another thing that you can use these for is for lifting out. So if you have an area where you have painted 
and then you want to go on afterwards with a damp brush and agitate that area. You can hear that agitation noise. This will work much better than trying to use a watercolour brush. So the next type of brush we're going to look at is a texture brush and this is a brush that is specifically designed for creating texture in your paintings. So let's look at these texture brushes. Now why didn't I have a nice neat fan brush to show you? It's because I've hacked all of mine to look like this and yes you can also buy them in this shape if you'd like to pay twice the price. All I've done with this is um, it's a, an acrylics fan brush and I've just chopped into the ends. Now this sort of brush is great for painting trees. So you might have seen some of my other videos where I show you how to paint trees. And what you can do is just pick up your paint and you can get these lovely marks in. You can see how they're absolutely fantastic for painting foliage. They're not only useful for painting trees and for painting foliage, they're also great for painting fur. So you can dry them slightly and then you can use them to create a sort of a dry brush fur technique. I do have other videos on this channel all about how to paint fur and you can layer up the colors. A really, really useful sort of brush for fur textures, for hair and also for foliage. The next type of texture brush you can use is a stencil brush. Now this one's actually a makeup brush. It's a foundation brush, it's just a cheap one. It's got quite soft bristles. If you buy a stencil brush from a DIY household shop, then it's gonna have much firmer bristles. Neither is right or wrong, it's just a matter of what you prefer. And what we can do then, and um, people don't often do this, but it's perfectly possible to stencil with watercolor. You just have to make sure, just like you would do with normal stenciling, you get rid of the excess water first and then you just apply it as you would do with your household stenciling or with any craft and you can build up areas. I've got a little piece of tape here. How interesting is that? Now the next type of brush that you get for texture is one that you buy ready-made and these come in all different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they just have very rough ends. Sometimes like this one, they've actually been cut. So I don't know if you can see, you've got sort of thicker hairs here and then you've got thinner ones at the end. And this should, I haven't used this brush yet, but this should give us sort of a row of stripes almost. Now again, these ones vary hugely. Some of them have actually got physical gaps that you can see in them. And some of them like this one, just the gaps start to appear as you apply the paint. And you can then use them to get either those dry brush effects or again for things like grasses. So this one's giving, this one's quite nice actually. It's giving quite fine marks. As I said, you can get them so they're cut a lot more formally than that with actual little bits spiking out. So there's all sorts of brushes like this and they do come in different shapes and sizes. To be honest, you can actually easily make your own just by attacking them with a little pair of nail scissors. This one is a soft brush, so it's giving very soft marks. If you were to do this with an acrylic brush and cut into an acrylic brush, you'll get much sharper, more formal marks like this one here. Next up, we have a brush that's not a paintbrush at all, and it's a toothbrush. These are really, really useful. So there's multiple things that you can do with a toothbrush. This is an old toothbrush, and you can see that, um, well, maybe you can't see it's so old, but um, originally it was one of those toothbrushes that has kind of the zigzag shape to it, cut into it, so that it gets in between your teeth and gums. And those actually, um, you know, once they're old like this, they are even better. You can use these for paint. You can also use them for masking fluid. There's two things you can do with these. You can paint with them and you can splatter with them. They're particularly good for beaches and pathways and textures like that. So what I can do is I can pick up some paint and um, let's paint with it first of all. So I'm just going to sort of tap it on the paper and you can see that I can make some nice marks here. So I could get some sort of beach marks going in. And whilst that's still wet, I could go in with a little brush and make some of those a bit more rounded if I wanted to. The other thing I can do with a brush like this is I can splatter. So when you're splattering, you want to get your thumb underneath like this and you're gonna pull it backwards. When you pull it backwards, the splatter will go forwards and you're also going to point it downwards at your paper and mask off any areas where you don't want the splatter to go. And you can then splatter like this, it gives a lovely effect. If you don't have the manual dexterity to do this, if you perhaps got arthritis or something like that, all you need to do is get a flat blade knife from your kitchen drawer 
and then just point the toothbrush downwards and drag the blade of the knife backwards across the bristles you can get exactly the same technique i find an old toothbrush to be endlessly useful for painting so wow that was a lot of paint brushes but which ones do you actually need which ones are essential i'm going to tell you now about the ones that i would choose if i only had access to a limited selection but please do remember that this is just personal preference. You know, if one of the brushes that I showed you earlier that I said, well, you know, I never use this brush. I don't think it's much use for watercolor painting. Maybe that's your favorite paintbrush and you use it in every painting. Paint brushes are a personal choice and they depend hugely on your painting style and the subjects that you paint. So if you have a paintbrush that's an absolute favorite, maybe you even prefer painting with an acrylic brush for all your watercolors, that is absolutely fine. If it works for you, then it's all good. So just before I share with you my all time most favorite, most useful watercolor painting brush, have a look at these samples and see how smoothly they've applied. If you're having trouble manipulating your paint and you just feel like you don't have any control over your paintbrush, it's all to do with water levels. I do have a complete beginner's watercolor painting course. If you're interested in that one, you'll find a link in the description of this video to all of my painting and drawing courses. So let's talk about what brush I would choose if I only had one. It would be a brush like this, a large round brush. This would be a size 10 or a size 12, and it's got to be the most useful, most versatile type of paintbrush. You can do a flat wash with it. You can also do fine detail with it. What about if I'm letting myself have three brushes? First of all, I'm going to add a smaller version of my large round brush. I'm not gonna go down to those tiny, almost unusable brushes, but I'm gonna go for something like a size four or a size six, so I can get a little bit more fine detail. The next thing I'm going to add is a flat brush. Really, really useful to have a flat brush for doing large flat washes and large skies, absolutely invaluable. Now, if you have a look in the description of this video, I have my own brush set made by Jackman's Art Materials, which will give you these three brushes at a really, really good price. If you're watching this video when it's just come out, I do have a bit of an Easter offer code for you as well. So do have a look in the video description at my basic set of beginner's brushes. So let's add two more brushes. What are the other two brushes that I would add to these and that I do 99% of my painting with? Well, the first one actually is this one, this old battered acrylic paintbrush that I've hacked into with an old pair of hairdressing scissors, endlessly useful for texture. And because it's got that curved shape, you don't get these unnatural looking hard edges. So I would add this one to my collection. And last of all, and this one will make you laugh, it's my toothbrush splattering making marks with a rough brush like this absolutely invaluable for pathways for beaches for trees for foliage really for anywhere that you want some random texture you can't beat a bit of splattering if i only had five brushes these would be the ones so do let me know in the comments if this video has inspired you to try some new different types of paintbrushes out. Perhaps you'd also like to tell me what your favorite paintbrush is. And before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. There's all sorts of good stuff in there. There are some free downloadable PDFs full of painting and drawing tips. I've even got a free watercolor course that you can take. And if you're just getting started on your painting journey, you're going to find that drawing skills are really, really important. It can seem quite daunting learning to draw, but I've got lots of videos that give you some really really basic hints and tips i've even got a full drawing course if that's something you're interested in that's in the video description as well but you can start by learning about the 10 most common drawing mistakes i'll put that video up right now